All right, good morning. It is May 13th, and uh, this is Tough Grass Team Times. It's the second last of the bi weekly uh, opportunities. We've finally had a week of good to very good weather, and so everybody's just trying to catch up with exploding grass growth. <clears throat> um, online today, we got Dr. Dave Shetler and Dr. Dave Garner, so it's the Dave and Dave show. And Dr. Shetler, you're going to leave the way with an insect update. Sure, be glad to. Uh... What I'm, uh, I wanted to start out with, uh, obviously last summer we had the, the big outbreak of the fall armyworm. Uh, and, and so I've kind of started to watch more closely what our agronomic friends are doing and some of our Southern turfgrass friends are doing. And uh, the Southern folks aren't reporting much on the, the fall armyworm yet. It's a little early even down there for them to, to be experiencing damage. But I was rather shocked at, at one of our field crop uh, entomologists who shared about three weeks ago his pheromone trap uh, counts. Uh, and, and what was kind of alarming to me was the large number of black cutworms. Uh, remember, black cutworm does not live here over winter. It, it can't tolerate the freezing temperature. So it's another migratory insect that comes up uh, to Ohio from the south. But he was getting very large numbers of black cutworms uh, in his traps. And the reason why I'm concerned about that is that we don't have any corn up. Uh, and, and when we don't have corn up, those black cutworms that arrive here say, well, I can't find a good soft uh, grassy type crop to feed on. Maybe I'll go to turf. Um, and so I wanted to mention that, especially for the golf course superintendents that have to deal with those little cutworm pock marks that can occur on the greens and tees uh, that they may see that early this year. It's we're just about uh, at the time uh, we would be three weeks away from that fly up. Uh, that would be about a week for the eggs to develop and two weeks for the larvae. So the larvae are, are getting to be about the size that they can make those pock marks. The reason why I mentioned this is that if you are using something like a celebrin uh, or, or one of the other diamides uh, like Tetrino for your season-long caterpillar control, probably ought to get it out pretty quick. Uh, both of those have good curative action, but they also have long residual for the rest of the summer. We know that, that uh, lawns and golf courses that were treated with a celebrin last year didn't experience uh, the fall armyworm damage that occurred in, in August. So uh, the, the residuals of these are, are quite long. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, the other thing for the lawn care company, uh, this last week we experienced a nice, long, warm, dry spell, and bill bugs love that. Um, and my feeling is, is that uh, we could see a significant amount of bluegrass bill bug damage, primarily in Kentucky bluegrass lawns. Uh, and, and so you might want to consider, uh, you can still put down what I would call a, a sort of late preventive curification. Uh, almost any of the neonicotinoids will work fine. However, we do know that arena has the longest residual activity. So if you put down arena in May, there will still be a sufficient residual of that to kill the white grubs uh, that come into the turf in July. Unfortunately, Merit and Meridian can run out of steam. Uh, and, and so you may have to split your application, make a half rate uh, in May, and then come back and, at the end of June and put down the other half rate so that you have sufficient residual to kill the, kill the white grubs uh, that will be coming in. Uh, and they, speaking of the white grubs, I'm not expecting again uh, to see much damage from the white grubs. The white grub population got really knocked out last year uh, because of the early uh, uh, saturated soils, uh, but they will be building this year and there will um, likely be some areas where they might build up enough population to cause damage. That's my update uh, for, for this uh, period. Thanks, Dave. Doom and gloom and foreboding forecasts. Nothing like an entomologist's place to be living in. Dr. Gardner. All right, good morning, everybody. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right, so some weed issues to uh, talk about today. Um, crabgrass, 
uh, has germinated, of course. And uh, I don't know, usually we see some germination in late April. And then, you know, depending on the weather, um, you know, the population can kind of stagnate. Um, but in this case, at least out at the OTF Center, I've got a, uh, um, an unusually robust population of one and two leaf crabgrass um, at this time. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what to do if you have a situation that's similar to that. Now, obviously, we're kind of out of the window for use of uh, a pre-emergence herbicide, um, but there are some pre- and post-emergence combinations that uh, you can consider. And I would do this on areas where you've had, um, you know, severe crabgrass pressure in the past. Um, you know, one thing that you could do is just wait a little while until the crabgrass becomes visible in the lawn um, and then go ahead and treat with a post-emergence product. And we usually focus on that more in late June or early July. But um, if it's a place where you've had a lot of uh, crabgrass pressure in the past and uh, um, you want to try to avoid that issue this year, um, it's a little too early to use just a straight post-emergence herbicide. The problem is, is that crabgrass is still germinating. So, um, you know, all of those products will be highly effective, but then more crabgrass will just germinate and fill in all of the spots where, you know, you just got rid of the crabgrass that was there. So um, there are products that combine a pre and a post-emergence herbicide. Uh, so, and then there are a couple of herbicides that have early post-emergence activity. So for example, dithiopyr, um, marketed originally as Dimension. Actually, if you use the liquid formulation of that, um, it does have activity post-emergence on one or two leaf stage crabgrass. Um, so, you know, we're probably bumping right up on the end of the window where you could get away with using that, depending on where you are in the state. Um, but then other products like uh, Tenacity, Echelon, or Cavalcade, uh, PQ, these are products that either have pre- and post-emergence activity or they combine a pre-emergence herbicide with a post-emergence herbicide. So um, if you're in a situation where, you know, you weren't able to get your pre-emergence out and you were seeing some crabgrass um, and you had a big problem with it last year and you want to try to uh, um, ward off that same problem this year, you might consider uh, the use of one of these products or the other strategy, like I said, is to wait until the uh, crabgrass becomes more visible in the lawn in June or July and then spray with a post-emergence then. This is the time of year that we usually focus on controlling our broadleaf weeds, right? So uh, dandelion and white clover, if that's mostly what you have a problem with, um, then there are um, a lot of herbicides that uh, contain the classic combination of 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba. Um, and then there's some other products that contain different combinations of the older phenoxy herbicides. These tend to be a little bit less expensive. And again, if you have just dandelion and clover and not a lot of anything else, um, these are good products that you can consider um, and, you know, they're a little bit more cost effective. Now, that said, a lot of these herbicides are highly effective when you spray them. Um, there are also products out there that you can use that are uh, granular products with those same phenoxy herbicides impregnated on them. And um, I've done some testing with those over the years. And um, what I'm showing in this graph here is I've got uh, three um, three products, and we're going to just call them uh, brands, actually four products, brands one, two, three, and four compared to an untreated control. And what I'm showing here with the dandelion control is that it starts out fairly okay at days 14 and 28, depending on the granular product, you can get around 50 or 60% control. But then after that, the dandelions kind of start to rebound and recover. My point is this, um, for those of you that are watching this, that uh, um, you know, you're a homeowner, um, you might have access to these materials, know that they are effective at tamping down a relatively light population of broadleaf weeds in your yard. So if you've got you know, like 10 to 15% uh, cover, um, no more than that, of uh, those types of weeds in your lawn, then the granular formulations can be pretty effective. But if you've got more than that, um, then you, know, you might consider using a liquid formulation. That's going to be more effective at actually reducing the broadleaf weed population. And then you can go back to using the granular formulation to maintain you know, the relatively lower level. Um, the other thing is that if you've got some of the more difficult to control weeds like Creeping Charlie or Canada Thistle or Wild Violet, then there are a um, myriad of other herbicides on the market that contain um, you know, herbicides like triclopyr, fluoroxapyr, 
um, or any of the protox inhibitors like carfentrazone, sulfentrazone, and et cetera. These materials, um, while more expensive, also tend to be much more effective at controlling um, these more difficult weeds. So if you've got a diversity of tougher to control weeds, then products like Game On, Sure Power, T Zone, Speed Zone, Four Speed XT, just as an example, not meant to be to the exclusion of other products that may be similar, paraphrasing that disclaimer that we're supposed to say, right? Um, then, you know, those products are, you know, what you would consider when you've got more difficult weeds to control in addition to just dandelion and clover. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention, the last time that we had this uh, um, recording, I wanna say that I made a comment about um, strange grasses in the lawn. And, uh, um, you know, that generally speaking, we only have so many that are a serious problem that can survive repeated mowing. What was kind of unusual this year, um, I found was that um, I had a lot of uh, uh, folks send me samples or pictures of this plant, rough bluegrass, and it didn't look anything like what rough bluegrass is supposed to look like morphologically. So I put it in the greenhouse, I grew it out, I got a seed head, which is the ultimate way of identifying a grass and just to find out that it was rough bluegrass. Okay, so, um, you know, really the bottom line, again, when you've got those unusual grasses that look odd um, in the landscape, um, you know, during the month of May, Usually they will start to blend in a little bit more late May, early June. Um, but if they don't, and aesthetically they're a problem, just know that in almost all cases, you're having to resort to the use of a non-selective herbicide such as glyphosate and then reestablishing those areas. But um, I, I usually tell people, you know, wait until uh, you see what it looks like during the month of June to determine whether or not it's a problem. And if it is a problem, then plan on doing the renovation, you know, the, the control of that in August and then reseed that area in September. Um, otherwise, Ed, I think that's all I was going to mention today. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. And for those that are wondering, his clothes, he's paid for them himself and he's not sponsored by any of the chemical companies for large amounts of ca cash that's unhidden or unrequited. He, 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 he's a genuine, honest person. <laughs> uh, Dr. Gardner, one thing that I've noticed is our soil temperatures have popped into a very favorable situation as far as um, our growth and, and the amount of uh, green leaf material. You know, is this the right time to be making a fertilizer application for homeowners or maybe they should hold on until a little bit of a slowdown in the growth? It's, it's an interesting problem because a lot of the homeowner formulations are tied to the broadleaf herbicide. <clears throat> and so, you know, the standard practice is to attempt to control the dandelions right after they've bloomed because they're supposed to be in a physiologically weakened state. And so those herbicides are supposed to be more effective then. But then you might be accidentally putting down um, an amount of fertilizer that's not necessary in order to sustain the natural growth of the grass at this time of the year. Um, you, you know, I would say it, go ahead and make the fertilizer application, but just know that, you know, the rule don't be removing more than one third of the leaf tissue at a time if you're trying to, um, you know, keep the lawn healthy still applies. So if you were already mowing, um, every five days or every four days, um, you know, this, this might not be the greatest time to put out a, an additional fertilizer application. Um, you might wait a couple of weeks, um, then, then maybe try to do that operation. But again, the, the complicating factor there is that oftentimes they link the, the um, herbicide application for the broadleaves with the fertilizer. And, you know, the timing may not coincide perfectly with what we would, you know, teach in a class, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, a couple of other things. Uh, some of you probably noticed some of the trials starting to come together early in the season uh, with an eye on field day. Um, so we're starting to put together activities for that in August. Um, if there's any questions about attendance, uh, reach out to us. Um, other things going on, we've started our field trial season in general. Uh, classes have wrapped up. Uh, on campus and students are either on internships or they're now bitterly giving out about the choice of career they've made. Uh, and finally, from the standpoint of uh, progress, uh, Dr. Street's replacement is in hand and we're starting the next stage of interviews with various candidates. 
And if you've not heard, there is also a combined entomology pathology position that is now open. Uh, so we should have a, a change in the faces over the next probably six to nine months, uh, hopefully going forward. Um, once again, thanks for your time. Oh, oh, it, it, Steve, oh, bit, oh, sorry. Oh, but before we go, I've got a fun one to, to, to put. Uh, for those that are in the industry, uh, they may have heard there was a big move afoot by the, the pollinator people uh, for no mo may. Uh, and and uh, uh, can, can you give me the rights to, to share my screen and, and what I'd like to do? I did take a little walk around my neighborhood this last uh, weekend, and I found what I think is a really good example of a no mow lawn. Uh, and and uh, as you can see, the, the dandelions are doing their thing. Uh, I think they, they, <laughs> they actually came out to try to mow the, the lawn and it was so thick they couldn't even get the lawnmower through it. Uh, and, and again, we do know that when you let this turf grass go for, you know, if you let it that, this has probably only been let go for a week and a half. Uh, but if you let that turf go for a full month, uh, you might as well get the hay baler out uh, and as, as uh, Dave and Ed would tell you, if you scalp that lawn down, you're probably going to kill a significant uh, amount of it and then have crabgrass and other things coming in there. Uh, and it's going to be a, a total uh, uh, travesty. So again, uh, I'm not recommending uh, no mow may. Uh, I think there's better ways to do the pollinators like let's plant some good flowering <laughs> plants in our flower beds. Uh, for these. And as you can see, there's no flower, other flowering plants in those flower beds there. So get rid of some of that shrubbery and put in some nice flowering perennials uh, and you'll have some pollinator uh, uh, habitat that, that uh, everybody can appreciate. Sorry, right, that, and I, just, I, I, I thought that might be a, a good ending point here for our turf uh, colleagues. You, you know, on a related note with the NOMO may kind of coinciding, you also have people at this time of year that will put signs in their yard that say um, that they're letting their grass go to seed. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, not, not, not recognizing that, you know, your typical, um, you know, turf grass seed farmer, it's not like they just don't mow during the month of May and then mow and then that seed is viable, right? It's, it's pretty much a season long process. So, uh, um, you know, the, the, that this idea that you're going to let the plant, you know, flower up, and then, you know, after you think that the seed is, um, um, you know, sure. yeah. you're going to mow, and that's going to somehow thicken the lawn. It's like, yeah, every universally, people um, uh, harvest, if you want to put it that way, you know, a couple of months too early. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, if you're not, it, it, unless you're committing to, uh, um, you know, letting those plants, you know, mature until September or thereabouts, um, you know, that that's just something that doesn't work. Yeah, I had to explain that to one of the local uh, uh, weather people that uh, we were out doing a, a remote article and, and he said, oh, look, the grass is seeding. And, and uh, if I just wait another couple of weeks and then mow it, will that thicken up my turf grass? And I said, no, uh, that seed needs about three months to mature. And, and so... <laughs> All you're doing is just harvesting uh, embryos at this point in time, uh, which are, are not going to produce a new plant for you. Pertinent timing on embryos, Dave. Uh, <laughs> now, on the positive note, on a positive note, if you are going to embark in no more May and you then wait until the 1st of June to mow and you kill half your lawn, you have no more July, no more August, and no more grass into September. So it could be a win, win, win. The one thing I will say is, as I understand it, and I'm going to stand correctly here, this originated up in Wisconsin. And, you know, no more May, nothing against the good people in Wisconsin. It's still got snow on the ground potentially up there. Dr. Coke may fire back at me for this. Yeah, but they're probably just letting the grass grow. grow out of the snow mold. <laughs> there is a difference, right? So that they are not getting the same amount of growth as we would be in that period of time. And Dr. Shedler, in, in, in your best estimate, from the standpoint of high cut turf and ticks, would that be potentially a problem if you do allow that to occur? Yes, uh, and, and actually I'm more concerned about people that say they wanna turn their backyard or their front yard into a wildlife habitat. Uh, and, and they just let the grass grow up and, and the weeds and everything like that. Remember that rodents love that. Uh, 
uh, mice, voles, rats really like that high cover because the predatory birds can't find them or see them. Uh, and most people are unaware that the larval ticks, virtually all of our species of nuisance ticks, the larval tick has to have a small rodent as its host. So all you're doing is creating really good habitat to increase the tick population in your yard. Well, again, we're not saying don't do it. We're just making you aware of what it will do. Right. <laughs> all right, folks. Thank you for your time. And we will talk to you again in two weeks.